afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning or this afternoon for the discussion that we're having today. So welcome to the webinar. Um, I'll just let you know that the schedule for today is that we're going to hear from Tui Raven, who's going to talk about the First Nations collection description guidelines that she's authored, followed by a panel discussion with Tui, Damien Webb, Michaela Goodwin and Anthony McLaughlin. Just a quick reminder, if you could please... Oh, sorry, I've just seen a comment that there's no sound. Is that the case for everybody? Okay, so other people can hear, so I'll keep on talking. Um, so apologies. So if I could just ask you to use the, uh, the Q&A function if you have any questions for the panel and obviously just the chat to chat. And now what I'd like to do to um, get the this afternoon's proceedings underway is invite uh, Mari Louise Ayres. So to formally introduce today's launch event, please welcome Dr Mary Louise Ayres, the Director General of the National Library of Australia. Thanks very much, Kathleen, and hello and welcome to everybody. It's my very great pleasure to be introducing this launch event for a remarkable collaborative project, Guidelines for First Nations Collection Description. Today, I'm joining you from Canberra on the lands of the Noonawal and Ngambri peoples. Now, on behalf of all partner organisations, I acknowledge First Australian peoples as the traditional custodians of this country and recognise their continued connection to land, sea and culture. I pay my respects to the resilience and strength of ancestors and elders past, present and emerging and extend my respect to all First Australians peoples. The Nunawal people have gifted me some words that I'd like to share with you. Darawanuna, Barawanunawa, Yangu Narawari, Dunamanyan, Nunawari, Darawari, Ingara Dindi, Wangarali, Jin Yin. This acknowledgement focuses on the fact that we're all meeting here together, together in this place. And this seems especially important to me today, as the guidelines that we are launching are very much about meeting from all over this country, about meetings of minds and hearts, and meeting together to affect change, something the library profession is especially good at. For many years, libraries across Australia have been grappling with the question of how best to describe the contemporary and historic First Nations materials in our collections respectfully, meaningfully and consistently. We know that good metadata is the first and most critical step in improving collection discoverability and access. In the case of First Nations collections, we are especially concerned with improving discoverability and access for the communities that those collections relate to. This is the basic premises of the guidelines project that First Nations communities have a right to know about collection materials pertaining to them and that discovery of those materials should be possible not only without encountering offensive language, but by using search terms, languages and paradigms beyond the inherited, inherited metadata schemas that libraries are accustomed to. Only by improving discoverability in this way can we do the deeper work of building the library community relationships necessary to ensure that collections are appropriately housed, accessed, used and attributed. There's a growing expectation that library professionals will have the skills and awareness to do this work, to recognise Indigenous knowledges and to support community engagement. That means all of us, that means all of us need to unlearn what we think we know, listen, think differently, and change our habits of mind and the ways in which we go about our work. This is not fast work. It is slow work that needs to be built and sustained over long periods of time. My own journey in this space has certainly been one of many years. From a generalised feeling to, of not particularly well-informed goodwill, through some moments where I felt that everything I thought I knew about collections was turned on its head, through a need to listen and reflect and back out again to leading my own organisation through a program of significant change. 
This expectation of change is clearly reflected in ALIA's new framework for the library and information services workforce. As library professionals, we are doers. So alongside awareness, deep thought and skills, we also need the right tools to turn this change process into workable solutions that make things better for the communities that we serve. Coming up with broadly applicable practical guidelines for use within and beyond the library sector across Australia is no mean feat. This is front of mind for me following the National Library's recent release of protocols for Indigenous cultural and intellectual property. This has taken us several years of sustained work and while the protocol is really important, it's actually all the checklists and processes that sit behind the protocol that bring our intentions to life. This is the case also, of course, with this particular document. I'm very aware of the complexity and consultation involved in producing a document of this scale. But fortunately, one of the great qualities of this sector is that we are superb collaborators. My congratulations to the five partner organisations who took the initiative to join forces and turn a widely shared need into a tangible document freely and publicly available. NASLA, ALIA, Call, Cabal and IATSIS. Our collective thanks go to the working groups who put so much time into this, to First Nations advisory groups for partner organisations who provided thoughtful feedback, to all of those who responded to the sector-wide survey at the outset of the project, and to the project co-leads, Sarah Davidson and Kathleen Smeaton. Australian library professionals, we should be really proud of this work. And of course, there would be no document at all were it not for the generosity and expertise of its author, Tui Raven. Tui Raven is Yamaji Nunga and has for many years operated a sole trader business specialising in Aboriginal cultural advising, research, project management and art curating. Her interest in reparative description comes from working at the State Library of Western Australia, where alongside other responsibilities, she coordinated the From Another View project, a reimagining of, of exploration history from Aboriginal perspectives. Last year, Tui enrolled in a PhD at Curtin University to tackle the issue of First Nations collection description and to reimagine archival and cataloguing practices using First Nations knowledge systems. So I think the journey that we're embarking on today is only the first step. I think we have so much more that we need to learn, undo, redo, so that we can actually really be fully working with First Nations communities to make sure that these collections are accessible, known uh, to, to those communities and used as they should be. We're really so lucky as five partner organisations to find somebody so well qualified and well placed to pull this project together in under 12 months. So our thanks and a very warm welcome now to Tui Raven. Tui, over to you. Hi everyone, uh, Kaya, just let me share my screen. Um, so first I'd like to start off by acknowledging that I'm coming from Nam um, in Victoria. I acknowledge the Wadanjeri and Bunurung people of the Kulin Nation. Um, I'd also like to point out they, these lands were never ceded. Um, Bunurung and uh, Wadanjeri people still have very strong connections to sky, land, sea and waterways. Um, I pay my respects to uh, elders past, present and emerging. Um, also any special shout outs to any mobs online today. Um, and also, I always say this um, in an acknowledgement, I say to our future leaders power on, and that's because Indigenous people have had to go through quite a lot of struggles to get to the point that we're at now. Um, and before I start, there's a couple of um, quick thank yous I'd like to give, especially to Sarah Davidson, Kathleen Smeaton, and Phoebe, I'm going to forget Phoebe's last name, I'm so sorry, Phoebe, um, who are on the project group. And then also to the, the metadata specialist to sort of help me get my head around it. That's uh, Alyssa McCulloch, um, Anthony McLaughlin and Glenn Wells. Without um, those three people, it would have been very difficult to write these guidelines. 
So the project started well before I became involved. So in 2021, there was an audit of Indigenous collections. So we need to find out first, what does it look like? So NESLA did an audit for um, four collections. That's the National Library of Australia, State Library of Queensland, um, State Library of New South Wales and State Library of WA. And then with further discussions, obviously realised the need for the guidelines and then started the um, advisory group. I became involved as a consultant in March 2023. And from then on, I started the research and the writing of um, the guidelines and then drafting in later July. So why have we got these guidelines? And you know, what is it about these guidelines that it may be not what you're expecting? So they are systems agnostic in that they've created in a way that can help you apply your own practice within your own library. Um, it's to basically um, help with increased discoverability of First Nations materials. So this is about helping Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people reconnect with them, materials that are created by them or um, have been created by somebody else. And it's also to encourage anti-racist and reparative description practices. So the audience. In the purpose of the guidelines, it says that the audience for the, um, the guidelines is for library staff, and that's only partly true. It's actually the three audiences. It's First Nations people, uh, library and archive users, and the library and archive staff. We're asking the library and archive staff to make changes to the description practices, but we also need our First Nations people to lead that. It'll be up to them to decide some of the ways that things are described. And then we also need our library and archive users to understand exactly what the changes are. Sometimes you'll notice as a library user, you might look at an, an item and then later on down the track, you'd be like, that's got way more subject headings on it. Those will be the changes that our library users will, um, will get to and be like, I need to understand what that looks like. So the guidelines, pretty self-explanatory, the structure of it. Um, it is a large document for a very good reason. We need you to understand some of the context around why it's been created and also um, the definitions and, ter and terminology. There are a couple of things that are out of scope and that's the access protocols. Um, it will be up to each library or archive to decide um, what the access protocols are in relation to objects and materials and also to write those protocols. Community engagement models is out of scope as is writing an Indigenous culture and intellectual property framework or protocol or policy, whatever your organisation calls it. it um, it doesn't have those within the guidelines, but it is premised on it. So in order to understand the guidelines, we're asking you to understand a whole new knowledge system. So basically, and I like to use this little metaphor, you're basically getting an Indigenous knowledge system and trying to cram it into a, a very standardised way of looking at materials. And so in order to do that, you need to understand um, Indigenous culture and intellectual property which you can describe as roughly cultural heritage or Indigenous knowledges or traditional knowledge, cultural protocols and um, cultural heritage terminology. And the cultural heritage terminology can help you understand how things get used in, like, in a museum space as opposed to a library space. So some examples of cultural heritage or Indigenous knowledges would be um, understanding the use of plants, how the seasons work, um, and, and just group knowledge in general. The other thing to understand is that the reason why we use the ICIP as a framework is that it's really different to copyright and IP. So as a library professional, you may be used to what copyright looks like as opposed and, and IP, and there's a whole set of rules and legislation around what that looks like. Indigenous culture and intellectual property is, is actually a framework to understand group knowledge. And that's why we're asking you to understand that before you delve into the guidelines. So anyone who's online who has a phone, I'm just about to put up a QR code for you. So if I'll give you a few seconds to grab your phones and then I'll change the slide. So if you would like a better understanding about understanding Indigenous culture and intellectual property, True Tracks um, and Pathways to Indigenous Engagement, they've just opened up another session in February. Um, book through here if you can't find it, if there's a problem with it go to uh, Terry Jenke and company, and it's listed on their webpage. So the guidelines, what are the guidelines? There's four basic guidelines. Um, the one that has the most amount of information and will take a lot to get through would be guideline two. Um, guideline one is in relation to, um, you know, appropriate terminology, culture, inclusive language and derogatory terms. 
the appropriate terminology looks at things like why would you use uh, First Nations as opposed to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander or Indigenous or First Peoples. In the library context, if you're using the Library of Congress subject headings, you're you, you're defined within that space. So that's a standardised vocabulary and you have to use that if you're using the Library of Congress, which is um, Aboriginal Australians and Torres Strait Islanders are the two. So um, in general, you need to consider the environment in which you're adding uh, des um, uh, descriptions for your materials. Um, culturally inclusive language is um, quite self-explanatory. It also relates to how la our language moves and change. So. We, we move for the times, as does our language. And then derogatory terms as well, like uh, you might have words in your catalogue like native or Aborigine. Um, I personally wouldn't recommend, and it's part of the guideline to suggest that you keep those term, that terminology, and it's so that we can understand where we've been and where we're going. The other thing is you can't actually get rid of the word native because we have things like native title, and it's actually really good to look back at it. Um, the other thing is, is that some terms that are considered to be derogatory are all self-determined uh, language by um, First Nations people. So we may use it in uh, as a as a writer. We might call something that. We might have a group called it. Um, so it's important that you don't remove that kind of terminology. So the guideline two, which is the one I said is is the largest guideline, has the most amount of information in it. The classification is just in relation to the Dewey Decimal classification and how um, to be wary of how you use it because it has a bit of a um, cultural bias or Eurocentrism to it. Um, the subject headings and controlled vocabularies that deals with the Library of Congress subject headings um, and the IATS thesaurus, so Auslan and subject and place name thesaurus. Um, just a word of warning, it, it does address things like Auslan codes. Um, they are very helpful, but they can also, um, they also don't have things like Koori in it. So if you uh, are working in an area that you use another phrase that doesn't appear in Auslan codes, then you may need to use that phrase as well. Auslangs are um, specifically related to language groups and, and, and people, but there, are termino there is terminology that we as Indigenous people may use for our groups. Someone called me Koori once when I was on the East Coast and I got kind of offended. I didn't realise it was a generalised term and I'm like, I'm Noongar. So um, just be wary and work with your community when you're trying to um, do the labelling and description. And then the next section, which is the largest section of all, deals with um, contributors and authors, uh, ownership and provenance, keywords and search terms, notes, subjects or description elements ac and access conditions. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, for this section in particular, the, the bits that I'll just focus on will be contributors and authors and ownership and provenance. So ordinarily in a library space, you might just put the person who's recorded the song. Whereas for this section, we're asking you for um, the people that were part of that song, the Indigenous people that were part of that song, to put them down as a, as a contributor so that they can find their materials again. Ownership and provenance um, looks at the complexity of ownership and provenance. So in a museum or in a library space, provenance is from when the item was found and put within the collection, but it can have other different meanings across communities. So provenance may be all the, all the way back to when it was made prior to coming into the collection. Um, so just be quite wary of that and how you work with labelling. Um, and then access condi uh, conditions and restrictions this is this can be quite complex it's not in relation the description part is in relation to what are you going to put in there to notify your community that this item is restricted some communities might want to say as an example i use myself as an example they may want to say restricted to Noongar women that might be something that your community requests but in general um, a lot of them just request uh, the generalized this item's restricted please contact the library but again work with your community some might want it labeled so that they can go back and find it at some later date uh, contextual information, that's the smallest guideline. That's in there for a really good reason. Um, often in situations, there's a, a community event or some large gathering that occurs that gives you a really good overview of history and for people to find information. So the example we've used within this section is the tent embassy. So lots of people have come and gone from the tent embassy. And so it's important for them to go and find the information in relation to whether they've been there or whether they knew someone that was there at the time. Um, discrete groupings, which relates to highlighting Indigenous materials, 
um, and then uh, the digital archives. So the digital archives, the examples are the Gullawinku Community Library. So they, um, the discrete grouping that they've done is really interesting. They've actually labelled all of the collection within their own knowledge system. So they've created their own subject headings in a sense and actually uh, catalogued everything accordingly. And then there's the digital archives, which is um, the storylines and our editor, which is part of the Keeping Culture software. Um, most of those are mainly photographic based, but there are some genealogies and some extra materials. So this goes probably more into the collection management side, but you will need to describe it. And the other important thing about it, especially with the digital archives, is that these digital archives actually get used as reparative description by community members. So community members can get in there if it's been allowed to actually update the records um, and, and keep all instances of it. So it, that goes slightly to collections management, but it's also really important. And I think that's it for me. That's the basis of it. Um, I'll go back to the other one. We don't want people to look at those guidelines straight away. Um, I'm going to pass over to you, Kathleen. So I'll stop sharing my screen. move to the panel discussion now which I'll be chairing. So I'm Kathleen Smeaton and I'm the Director of Collection and Technology at Monash University Library. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded lands we're meeting on today. Now now I have been <laughs> sorry, hopefully you can hear me better. Does it sound better now? Yes. yes. Great. Excellent. So I just was uh saying um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the unceded lands we are meeting on today. Now, I've been lucky enough to watch these guidelines develop, and I think I can speak on behalf of all of the working group and advisory group when I say it's been an immense privilege to watch TUI create these guidelines. It's such an amazingly comprehensive and crucial piece of work that TUI's done. So um, thank you again, TUI, for doing this work. It's it's just astonishing what you've been able to do. So thank you. And with that, what I'd like to do is invite the rest of the panel to turn on their cameras. Okay, great. So I can see that we've got the panel here. Oh, Damien, I'll just I'll wait for Damien to turn on his camera. And I'll just introduce Hello, the panel. Hello, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, Building suspense. I was, <laughs> I was joking with Damien earlier that I would um, perhaps play Eye of the Tiger or something for all the panellists to run out to. So you may have been waiting for my musical cue and apologies to all the panellists that we didn't have that prepared. Um, so I'll just introduce uh, you. Sorry, I'll introduce you all to the audience and some of you will know some of the, the panel. So first of all, um, Damien. Damien's a Palawa man whose ancestral country is Lutruwita. Tasmania. He's worked in libraries for nearly 15 years and currently manages the Indigenous Engagement Branch at the State Library of New South Wales. Damien is also on the NASLA and ALIA First Nations Advisory Boards and currently chairs the International Federation of Library Associations Indigenous Matters Committee. So in between all that, Damien has been gracious enough to, um, to lend his time to come and speak today. So thank you very much, Damien. We've also got joining us on the panel two amazing metadata experts. What they don't know about metadata, um, nobody does. <laughs> uh, so first of all, Anthony McLaughlin. Anthony is Assistant Director in the Collection Development and Management Management Program at the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, commonly known as IATSIS, and we've got Michaela Goodwin. So Michaela is an Assistant Director in the Collection Management Team at the National Library of Australia, and we all know Tui from her introduction and the amazing work that she's done. So just flagging that we might not have chance to answer all the questions that have been populated today, but we will try and get through a few. And the first question that I am going to ask, which I think is probably one that frames the whole thing, and Damien, I'll, I'll throw to you for this one first. What do you think the main benefits of reparative or anti-racist descriptive practices are? Uh, look, I benefit directly from those practices. <laughs> so I guess selfishly less violence and racism in the archives that we're working in um, and particularly for the communities trying to access these collections. Um, I think Tui mentioned in her talk as well uh, having an awareness of where that language shifted, being able to see in our collections this um, ideally this, this trajectory upwards to more respectful um, critical librarianship. I think a lot of this falls under critical librarianship. I think 
a lot of librarians do understand how to do this work in other contexts, but maybe get a little bit freaked out um, or do get that kind of paralysis that comes from the fear of doing the wrong thing. Um, but I think we've reached the end of that being a viable excuse. I think doing the wrong thing publicly is better than doing nothing at all. And I, th and I guess bringing language like anti-racism is really important. We've spent a lot of time on concepts like reconciliation and trying to tackle what are systemic issues quite softly, um, culminating in, I guess, most recently the, the referendum, which gave us a fairly clear result. So I think what we're going to be seeing a lot more of is anti-racism, reparative work, um, truth-telling, and that is going to be a focus for First Nations communities for the next five or 10 years. And libraries have a huge role to play in fostering that kind of truth telling and making sure our collections are up to the task. Thank you, Damien. Um, Tui, is there anything that you wanted to add to that? Oh, sorry, Tui, you're on mute. Always. Um, I think for me, um, What's important with the with not just the anti racist description, but the reparative description is that um, people for a very long time have not understood our culture. And I think in actually trying to embed the way that we see in description practices can actually help people understand that the way that we view the world is not exactly the same. Our cultural practices, our cultural customs are quite different. And if you could actually see that in a in a structure so people can understand the difference. It might, it might undo, and would say undo, but it might help people understand how different we are. Thanks, Tui. Um, so I think we've 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 heard really why these are so important. So Michaela and Anthony, I'm I'm going to ask you the next question uh, for both of you. We know that this is a really important piece of work. What can we do at a library level to help implement such an important piece of work? Yes, <laughs> ladies first. Um, <laughs> These, these are fantastic guidelines, but they're not going to answer every question. They're not going to cover every single thing for everyone, but this is an amazing starting point that a lot of practitioners have not seen before. And as Damien said, and I know I myself have been that way, I've been so scared to do something in case I get it wrong, in case I offend someone, but by not doing anything, it's actually worse. Um, you're going backwards. So I think this is something that each institution, each practitioner needs to then create their own guidelines underneath that, which are specific to their particular institution, their particular needs rather, um, and set that up. So at the National Library, and I know that IATSIS has done the same thing, we have the ICIP protocols, which have been launched and are brilliant. Alongside, we will have these guidelines that TUI has written. Underneath that, we have a SEER, we have our own internal guidelines, we have checklists, we have things to look at and work with. Does that mean that we get it right? No, but it means that we do our very best to make things accessible and discoverable um, for First Nations people because the more time that we put into a record, and I know the catalogues don't sit there and read everything, all the books that come through, but the most that we can do, if there are languages in there, if there are you know um, community names, things like that, add them to the record, they enrich the record and they increase accessibility. So it's not spend 20 hours on one record, but do the very best you can with the resources that you have available. Um, so that's, I think, for me, Anthony. Um, I think one of the ways to look at it is in that in that sense of, of, of innovating in, in your library and, and understanding too that, and I, and, and I say this in the nicest way, the failure is sometimes part of that as well. And we build that in, into our work. And, and the very fact that we approach these things in good faith, I think is nearly 75% of the journey. And that's another element of this as well, is that it's it's a it's an ongoing process. It, it doesn't have, you know, you're not finished with this. Um, and it's and and another element of that is is the perspective. Marie Louise touched on this and so did Tui, is that what's the perspective that you're looking at? Um, describing an item in, in front of you. Um, we tend to, you know, think that we have a neutral kind of, um, you know, a neutral way of describing things as much as possible. But but in reality, there's actually no such thing. All of our descriptive tools are, um, you know, are, are deeply compromised in one way or another. That's just the reality of the world. Yeah. 
So, um, so under in understanding that allows us to be able to say, okay, we can also make brave changes that we choose to do, um, and and in further discussions, we might touch on elements like consultation with local Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples around things like this. Discussions within within libraries and and and. And I think having those very brave discussions and doing brave things is really the key to a lot of this work. Thank you. And I think in those answers, what you've touched on is a question that I know we've we've had in, in a few different forms, but I think what people are asking is, what do I do if, what happens if I get this wrong, which is about being brave. So um, Tui, I, I'm gonna ask you to answer that. What, what happens if I get it wrong? Uh, the best thing about getting it wrong is someone will tell you that you're wrong. So someone will come back and go, you've done this incorrectly and we'll help you actually with the description. So don't fear not, like in general, it's normally a helpful thing. Yeah, excellent. And did anyone else on the panel have anything to add to that about what happens if we get it wrong? Um, I just want to um, echo that as well. When, when someone tells you you've got it wrong, a really good thing has happened. You've, you've started engagement someone has read your catalogue record and has come to you and, and, and made a point. There's that whole concept of right of reply when we put things up is, is, asking, is asking our users, asking our clients to, to tell us what they want to hear. So this is a fantastic thing to some extent. Um, you know, that, that kind of thing when, and I know it's a terrible feeling, I don't want to put it out there, but once again, you know, you've approached it from, from a position of good faith. Yeah. And don't forget that um, any record that's on Trove, if you do see something yeah, that is wrong, you do have that facility on Trove yeah. to be able to um, put that feedback through and it goes through the appropriate channels and it's researched and then changes are made. And that's right, we just need to make, we need to do something. We can't do nothing. Yeah. And Damien, I could see you wanted to come in there as well. So oh, look, I've always got to <laughs> <laughs> um, Look, just really reinforcing the same point as everyone else. Um, it, it's really important. Um, and this is iterative. Uh, there will be people that take my mob that take issue with the language and approaches that we've used here in 20 years time. Um, this stuff is always iterative and our best attempt to understand our cultures. Now, I think it's really important to remember that there are already systems that do this. All of our library catalogs have some mechanism, even if it's just the person at the desk to receive corrections. Um, we have been talking about and actively correcting our collections for a very long time with public input. It's only suddenly very scary once we come into this space, which I guess is because we are looking at the foundational beliefs, um, kind of OG white supremacy in the sense of um, white supremacy beliefs and this, this that underpins a lot of our information systems. But if we are going to be genuinely, instead of just saying things like transparency and accountability, if we're going to actually be transparent and accountable, people need to see how we're making our decisions, where our information is coming from and where we're trying new things. I think otherwise you can say that you're transparent and, um, or neutral or accountable, but you're not. This is one way of guaranteeing accountability to broader Aboriginal communities is by being really open and showing you're working out. Mm. And while you're talking, I'll, I'll keep you talking because the next thing I was going to ask is these guidelines are amazing and TUI has done some amazing work, but there are already, as you said, there's there's existing thesauri frameworks and protocols. So how should we, what should we already be using and how can this add to what we already have to bring all this together to make sure we are sometimes getting it wrong, but moving in the right direction? Yeah, um, it's such an important point. Um, I've spent a I must be coming up to 10 years with, with Nessa now. And one of the things that routinely surprises librarians is how um, complex and robust there are. There are already systems for this. This work has been done over and over again, um, not always in your local context, but I mean, we had Brian Deere classification systems in the 70s, in the 70s. We uh, had Atsalone in the 90s here, which are still um, regarded globally as, as some of the best and most comprehensive broad First Nations um, guidelines or frameworks, I should say. Um, IATSIS subject thesauri, thesauri and the place names, they have come um, again. They've been around for a while. We noticed over and over again, people either didn't know about them or forgot about them because it wasn't embedded in their workflows. Remembering 
that those things exist when maybe your work gets you to catalog something that's First Nations every couple of months if it's sporadic. Um, the work wasn't focused on that. So people weren't remembering them. They're, they're hefty documents. People don't keep printed out copies in their desks. So this, for me, fills the space between some of those really aspirational frameworks, things like UNDRIP and the OCLC reimagining descriptive workflows. These are broad, these are big, these are manifestos in a lot of ways. And you look at those, you're like, how in the name of all the gods and devils would I possibly make this into something in the 40 minutes I have to describe this material today? Um, and I think this really does a good job of bridging that space. This will embed it in language um, that too is used, which is should be very familiar to everyone that works in this sector. It's clear enough to people outside the sector. Um, and I guess it'll be interesting to see if that was a genuine reason that stopped people using these things or whether um, asking for more and more specific tools was was um, maybe people trying to buy more time to not do the work. Um, I can be a bit cynical sometimes. So I'm really curious to see if this is the thing that people have been asking for, if this does um, finally help close that gap a little around what people are comfortable doing and what people see as their job. I think a lot of people still have the luxury and the privilege to to say, well, like, this isn't my priority. I'm not Aboriginal. This doesn't really impact me. So I'm going to choose to focus on something else. And so I'm hopeful that this will really help people and it is written from that perspective. Yeah. Um, thank you, Damien. Tui, I don't know if you've got anything to add there, but it would be interesting to hear your perspective on those other frameworks. And while we're talking about frameworks, there are a lot around. And how would we bring these, your the descriptive guidelines that you have so amazingly created um, in alignment with things like care principles for research repository collections? So what's the interaction there as well? So the interaction is, and I think I need to state this quite Obviously, this is about reparative description. Mm. It's not about creating all the other work for the um, that the libraries need to do. What it does do is, under the care principles is help you decide how to monitor and care for collections in a way that's culturally safe. So there are lots of there's um, you know the resources guide at the end of the guidelines document. You can go through there and there's there's like online resources, different guides and protocols and frameworks. Um, there's a couple of things that. Uh, uh, are new into the sector, like the Indigenous Knowledge Attribution Toolkit, which also looks at um, how we uh, use authorship and how we uh, use the uh, contribute an Indigenous person. That's also within the resource kit. So there's there's lots of stuff out there, like the um, OCLC that Damien worked on. Um, I think this has just sort of brought all of those sort of concepts together um, in a way that's easier to read and, and, and like a document list, like a resource list as well. Thanks, Tui. My next question, um, and I might throw to um, Anthony for this one, in terms of how are these guidelines going to be helpful in managing the collections? Because I can see we've got some questions, uh, you know, different types of questions around consultation with community. Is it going to tell me where, when, which books I should put away? Like in terms of doing that sort of work, will these guidelines replace the need to do those types of things or will they tell me exactly what I need to do? Um, in the very simple answer is no, they won't. Um, they, 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 again, have very different levels of the kind of work that you'll do. There's some very, I think in, in the very first instance, you know, sometimes you can tell immediately by, immediately by, by looking at, at a book, for instance, you know, there's, you know, if if the book contains um, and you suspect it might contain pictures of secret sacred ceremony, then it's probably wise to start being cautious with with who's got access to that book. But the simplest question here is 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 that this requires consultation and it can't and none of these suggestions can really happen in a, in a vacuum in the library. Um, they they that they may need um, the kind of consultation that, you know, requires you to ask people in Alice Springs or Port Hedland or, you know, or Cape York. And and a lot of the time um, community we found um, have been really open to having those discussions. And, and in some cases, um, it, in, in some cases, depending on the type of material you're looking at, um, it, may, it may also mean that those materials get sent back to country. And aren't kept at, at, at the library or archive 
that they are. But once again, these are these are very particular discussions that need to happen within the institution that's managing them. Um, this document does not tell you how to do that, and 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 that was one of that's an, an explicit exclusion because we can't decide um, on the you know we can't decide on the ho on the whole approach to our restrictions. Uh, that, I mean. Indigenous uh, culture in, in, in this in this country is is far from homogenous, and and I think every approach has to be done with a view to getting as much information as you can from both your local um, community and from and from wider ones as well. Thank you. I know you. that's really I know that's so general as to sound daunting, but I think that once you start looking at at these things, you you. You start realizing that you need to start speaking to people. You just have to start, and once you start, and you start talking, and you start. I mean, Anthony and I, Anthony and I have started talking to each other. So we connect. We throw things between each other. Um, finding those networks, those you know, the support. Um, that's that's a wonderful way to start, and it does help. Thank you. And Tui, I just was going to say to you, because these, these guidelines don't tell you how to do these, everything right, and, and I know you've been de very deliberate, so I'm wondering if, if you would like to speak to that as well, because it won't tell me exactly what to do at 11.30, 2am next Tuesday when I have a particular piece of material in, in front of me and the exact word. And one thing that we've been very clear about is we're not going to provide you a list of every offensive term, uh, which I know is something that's been asked for. So would you like to speak to why those guidelines won't do that and what the role for librarians engaged in critical librarianship should be in applying these guidelines. Yeah, so as Anthony pointed out, um, uh, Indigenous Australia is not homogenous. There are many, many language groups. And so the guidelines are there to assist you to work with your community. Um, we can't tell you what to do because I would have to have gone to every single one of those communities and there's over 200 language groups in Australia and that would have been quite a feat. And so we're asking you to do that work with your library because it's your collection. That's what the guidelines do. It, it helps you unpack how to work with your own community and your own collection. I thought I might just give a little example of it's it's a collection thing, but it's and it's not related to a parody description, but Damien would, might remember this. Uh, we were working on the Storylines project and there's a couple of um, photographs that you can't show. And we know that and often we're really busy and we forget to restrict it. You certainly know when you're out on country with these with this community and everyone, all the women just went like this. Like we knew instantly. And so we know when we go to those communities, we already knew that, but we know when we go to those communities, we are not to show any of those items that look like that at all. Mm -hmm. And so if you think you have items that look like that from that area, you just don't show them. And you ask, and I could tell from the reaction that the men were fine to look at it, but not the women, because the women were like, hey, like this up, like, you know, hands over their face, walk out quick, 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 get out. So what that did do is give us an opportunity to go, okay, if we do have more of these materials next time when we go, we'll be like, can we ask the women to leave the room so we can discuss these objects? So it gives you, the guidelines doesn't give you that. It helps you with the reparative side of it, but you can make mistakes in your collection. So you, you know, obviously, Secret and sacred, that's a bit different. Often you'll have a little bit of information around it as to why it may be secret or sacred. It makes it a lot easier. But you don't know if, an, if a photograph is related to secret or sacred because mm. if you grow up in a community where photographs just mean a photograph as opposed to my community where they actually signify something else, um, you only know by making the mistake. Thanks, Tui. Oh, sorry, Michaela, did you want to add something there? I was just going to add a very quick one on to Tui's as well. Is that one of the interesting things that's come across, certainly in speaking with our First Nations colleagues, is the, is the question is, is asked and sometimes quite forcefully, why do we even have this thing? Like, mm. what what is what is this object's place in in this in this collecting institution, um, and should it be somewhere else? So those so once again it's it's the discussion and it's the it's the consideration around it that leads to these yeah, outcomes. Mm. Jump in as well. Um yeah, I remember it all. I've only former uh, repressed a little bit of some of those trips to it. But again, like exactly as Tui said, you you do this work with people in a context that has some safety. Whether it's just you know where it's discussed that we're going to look some things that we don't have, 
all the provenance, um, as just mentioned, like get the provenance stuff in order because chances are these elders are going to know who the grandson of this pastoralist is that donated it. Then they're going to be able to help you fill that information in. But you create a space where you are clear with those expectations. So we're going to look at stuff that we may veer into something truly traumatic. My experience and my feeling in this might be controversial to say, but the two things that library non-Aboriginal library people are most terrified of uh, secret sacred and repatriation. These two topics just people freeze up. They're the two least discussed things um, for black fellas, for communities. Like the, the amount of like really explicit cultural uh, material that should not have ever been witnessed, let alone kept in a library, is comparatively tiny compared to the amount of stuff we have that's just problematic and leverages bad power dynamics or poor descriptions of what's actually happening. So we have this absolute panic about this secret sacred material. But as Tui mentioned, often that's indicated. Often that's the only stuff in our collection that actually has some clear um, First Nations context and even a sticker and, and instructions on how to work with it. Um, and as far as repatriation, like the, the number of requests that this library has ever gotten in 200 and nearly 200 years for things to be physically repatriated is, is very close to zero. Um, that discussion may happen, but that's further down the line. Communities are trying to find themselves in pieces of their histories, their families and their culture. This is a much more primal need. Um, and I know a lot of people are worried about consultation and it, it becomes a thing we say over and over again, but you really need to be collaborating. And if you're worried about overburdening your Aboriginal staff, which you should be worried about, we are tired and burnt out but we know how to do this and you need to resource it effectively um, and you need to be collaborating. If the community doesn't have a shared goal, if they don't have an active research project, if there's no one in the community that has the knowledge to look through collections and they're not doing that work. So what you're going to ask of them is an imposition, pay them for their time, pay them for their expertise. Um, other communities will, will tell you, we've got lots of communities we work with that once you've built that relationship, they'll say, hey, hey we're actually looking for, photographs of scar trees we're doing some work locally we you know can we come in and have a look those relationships get built but you have to value people's time and input and you have to collaborate you have to actually seek out some of the goals that communities are wanting to achieve and then leverage that as how you prioritize or just start chronologically with your collections like you there's no good or bad place to start but if you can be lining up your things with community priorities um, with what they're comfortable looking at and what they actually have the resources to look at. They might have a huge women's festival for the next six months. So can we talk about men's business at the moment? Because the women are all busy. Um, these things they will tell you and tell you very clearly. And as we mentioned, especially if you can can rock up in person and actually sit and hold that conversation um, for more than a couple of hours before you hit the next town. These, this is how you do this. And this is how collaboration is, um, is born out of that process. Can I just add uh, yeah. another, just, just add another point there? Just in, in relation to um, uh, work, work, how you work with your collections and your communities, and we've been talking about how it's uh, how it's all you know. Obviously, you have to collaborate. That's a big thing. You also need to understand the context of your collection. Mm. So, if you work in a library that has a very small collection, and it's a possibility you don't have any indigenous materials in there at all, then this guideline may not be for you. Like, but if you work in a large institution or if you work at somewhere like the University of Melbourne, which has quite historical collections, you might want to have a really good look at this guideline and see if you can apply it. So it may not occur at all. There may be a small section of the guideline which relates to you. Oh, why would I want to make my collection a discrete grouping? And why would I want to highlight and use the IATS as the SORI in my small collection? That might be all the bit that applies to your collection. So understand the context of it. The large institutions will probably want to use this more. The smaller ones, you may not need to use it at all. It's certainly a guideline for you to, to consider whether you would like to implement some of the practices. Thanks, Tui, and thanks everyone. I think that those points about um, making sure that we resource this properly are very, very important. This needs to be um, um, properly resourced because of the importance that Damien touched on, and I think all the panels touched on in, in having these materials available to aid in truth telling and allowing people to connect, which I think is, you know, is something that we all want to do. We want people to to see what's in our collection and access it for their benefit. 
um, so that they can see what's there. So thank you. I'm going to turn to some quite uh, specific metadata -y type questions now because um, we knew that when we release these guidelines, people would would have these types of questions. Um, we're all we've all worked in the library sector, so we all know that we there are many of us that like the detail. So I can see Michaela and Anthony have come off mute already in preparation for this. Thank you very much. So Michaela, I might ask you about this now. You know, things we've had questions about mapping Library of Congress to IATSA's headings. How does IATSA's keyword search? Would you like to delve into any of that kind of mapping or how this will work? Um, I think I'll talk about what we do at the NLA um, to start with. Um, so, there's the Australian extension to the Library of Congress subject headings and they have just popped an update on there while they go through a consultation process to work out how they're going to best um, help the um, community with that. And right at the top it says First Nations head to IATSIS. So we use, we strongly use IATSIS and it was really interesting taking part in the audit that Tui spoke about at the beginning how few people are utilising those um, IATSIS headings, so the place name, subjects, languages. We try and add as many of those as we can. And when in doubt, um, there is an email address that I'm probably not meant to tell you about that <laughs> Anthony will share with everyone in order to, to ask that um, question because we ask lots of questions. Um, that is so important because if someone types in where they're from and results appear, the only way, we, catalogers know, the only way you're going to get a result if that word is somewhere represented in your record. So we need to make it as accessible and discoverable as we can. And we know that the Library of Congress subject headings, they're all about America. What they have for us is very limited. Um, and the same as things like Thema, Fast, and all the other vocabularies that are out there and the Thori that are out there. Um, you've just got to use what you can that is specific to the material you have in hand, because that's what we're working to, what we have in hand. And another thing that we like to do is we look at our, um, the actual material for any information. Sometimes they give us subjects in the material, they've already put those classifications they want something linked to. So it's important to, to look for that as well. Um, but that's, yeah, so at NLA, we do everything we possibly can. And a shout out to my team um, who do a fantastic job in collaboration with our Indigenous engagement team here at NLA to really make that material accessible and discoverable. Um. I probably start by saying that um, the IATSIS thesaurus, thesaurus, the topical, is not mapped to um, LOC um, and it has very different governance and structure around it. And there's very different provenance as well about why, why IATSIS started using a particular set of terms to describe what was originally the IATSIS collection and a wholly collection about the culture and history of Indigenous Australia. Um, you can email us, <laughs> and the email address is, in fact, metadata at iaxis.gov.au. So I look forward to all those emails coming through this <laughs> um, and, my, and, my, and my very small yet very talented team um, who manage all, all of the vocabularies will be delighted to get them. I can hear them cheering me from here right now. Um, but no, but, but, the, the, but, that, but that point goes back again to what we were talking about, about, about Ryan replied, nothing exists in, in a vacuum. Mm. And if we want people to use the IATSIS thesaurus, we also need you guys as professionals to, to interrogate that as well. Is this um, um, a right for your collection? Does it describe what's in front of you? Where can you see flaws in, 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 in that set of vocabularies? And we would be genuinely delighted to see people engage with it in a critical way and not just in a sense that we need to apply these as some kind of um, you know, work that we must do. I think it's 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 work that that we want you to do because it's appropriate to describe and make discoverable the, the collections that you have. Um, and it's it's kind of an interesting question about about how how we describe everything. And you know, there's all the six fifty since and and there's all of our six hundred areas and where we 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 tip all that in. But you know, there's other parts of our of our cataloging all 
you know, utilising our 500 fields to make statements that either appear on books such as um, Indigenous knowledge statements, um, where books and maps and posters, um, you know, indicate that this material has been derived from or is directly influenced by Indigenous knowledges. I noticed a couple of years back the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, of all people, had it, had had put that such icy uh, statements on a lot of mapping they did of plants in um, northwest New South Wales, and we made a point of taking those statements and putting them in the catalogue record. I think they're not just useful; they're also useful for Indigenous people to see those statements and know that what they're looking at derives from their knowledge. Of, of those things as well. So you have a lot of tools at your hand um, here to, to really, um, you know, explore the uses of MARC. Um, it, is, it is, you know, um, a, a, a rarefied schema, but I think that we have the skills at hand to, to turn that to our needs and to the needs of First Nations Australians. And I think this is mainly talking about current material and current thesauri, current words that are available. And Chewy and Damien touched on this previously. When it comes to that retrospective material that has offensive terms in it, that has you know things that we don't currently use um, today, um, we tend to you know remove that because we're scared to have people see that we're you know that we were racist and things like that. But I think what Chewy and, and Damien said, we leave it in there, but we make sure that that in that five hundred note there is a content warning. There is something that say please be advised that there is going to be some distressing content. You know, please be advised that there is going to be some words that are of their time or of an attitude um, of an author that not you know, is not necessarily currently viewed. Um, so it is, you've got your retrospective and then we've got our future focus. I can't, I can't really emphasise enough how important it is to, to leave in, or should I just be more explicit and say it's really important for us not to give the impression we're whitewashing Australia's history. It's it's of the utmost important that we make it clear that these are, were, and and um, and could be the the, the opinions of, of the future as well. You know, this is this is you know we're we're here to show what history is and what it was, and that's and that's part of of this um, journey. Thank you. And a very specific question, Anthony, for you. How often are new Auslang and Iatsal people and language subjects headings added? So how often, that amazing team you mentioned before and all the work <laughs> that you're doing, how often are things like that looked at and updated? Um, the, the topical thesaurus, um, we haven't done much work on, 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 on adding new ones for a while now. I think that we're... We're concentrating on remediating what we have at the moment, and we hope we we also have, as I kind of intimated a, a, a minute ago, that by making these more widely used, we get more eyes on them and can add more context to the topical thesaurus in that way. The Auslang thesaurus, um, well, sorry, the Auslang um, um, set of data um, is administered by our the intellectual work and the aggregation of that work is in this way our linguists and our access in our research team um, and we collaborate with them to, to make sure that those updates that they do because it's quite fascinating without going too much into the linguistic world of it it's fascinating how how much you know we think that how how much non-indigenous australia thinks they know about you know first nations australia when it turns out that even after, you know, 150 or 200 years of research into languages and people, we still have it very wrong. And what I mean by that is that not everything in, in, in you know, in, in the work that we do is 100% right. And that's why that right of reply and, and that constant research and the constant re-evaluation of that is, is, is important. Um, so the simple answer is we don't update our topical as much as we like. We probably update our place names more because that um, we get more information constantly from publications. And our slang is updated as we get much clearer, clearer insight into languages and peoples. Thank you. Um, Tui, you touched on this in your presentation and I know um, I've heard you speak about it before. So 
inter, um, in ICIP, ICIP, I always call it ICIP, I know you call it ICIP. I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. And I guess that, that there's a question that's been raised about data sovereignty. So even though these guidelines don't necessarily cover data sovereignty, again, in that, you know, how does all of this interact and just how ICIP plays a role in so many of these different things, whether it's the guidelines, whether it's reparative description, whether it's around data sovereignty, if you could just speak to, to that. So with the data sovereignty and governance, I think the difficulty is, is that while the data is shared by Indigenous communities under a legal framework, it sits within an institution. Mm -hmm. And so how do you go through data sovereignty when it sits somewhere else? So you can do data sovereignty with the community when it comes to repatriation and helping them sort out their own instances of databases. Or you can work with your community as they did with the Gallowinku community and just created a whole new structure for them. So their data governance and sovereignty is based around using their own um, example of how they would organize it for themselves. In the context of this, it is, it's quite complex. So um, we do have um, instances around the world and I can't bring them up where we have shared um, collections. So as part of do uh, data sovereignty and governance, um, the library or a lab library may wish to consider actually sharing a collection with the Indigenous community, completely shared, description practices, access, all of it. Um, that's a very um, tough model to go. It's quite complex, um, but it, it it is really complex and it's not something I can answer with this. Um, but what it, what it does do is give you the framework for understanding that data and that's information about us or created by other people. So all the data in relation to First Nations people sits in this space where there's a million people trying to um, access, use, research, all those sorts of things. What data governance and sovereignty does do is helps us control access to that information. Thanks, Tui. Um, another question that I've got while you're, while you're off mute, Tui, and I mean, I'm acknowledging that the all the members of the panel today and myself are from fairly large institutions. So we're from sort of bigger places, there may be more staff and, and larger collections, but when you were writing these guidelines, can you speak to how you thought they might be applicable to different types of libraries, specialist health, law, um, smaller libraries, larger libraries? How did you take that into account when you were when you were creating the guidelines and how can the smaller or how can libraries of different sizes apply them? I think the best thing to do is look at your need, your community need. So start applying the guidelines in areas that are, or, you know, making changes within your descriptive practices for your community. So which is the community that comes to you with the most amount of need or access to your collection? That's the one you're going to focus on first, not some, you know, small collection that may never be accessed except by one researcher perhaps, but go with the community that you're going to be using it, um, who will be accessing your collection. That's where you need to start. The other thing is, is all the languages within all the different um, libraries are different, you know, health, uh, languages are different, are completely different to working in a state library or with a, with a local library. Mm -hmm. it, it does come, and again, again, it comes down to need. What is achievable with the amount of staff you've got? Um, and at the, at the most important thing is, what do we need to be discoverable? You need to update the descriptions on the works or collections, materials, items, objects, whatever you have in your collection that has the need to be um, accessed. That's where you start first. Thanks, Tui. Um, Damien, I'm going to ask you the next question. We talk a lot about discoverability. And in fact, you know, within libraries, access, discoverable, that's how we, we want to think of our data. I think that there is sometimes a concern when people are looking at these materials and we've had questions about, you know, what do I do if I see this type of material? What do I do if I see that type of material? And, and am I going to have to lock everything in my collection down mm. forever? So I think that sometimes people might approach this from that uh, that point of view, which is not necessarily helpful in the first place, because it's coming from a position of we own it, so we should be able to control it. But putting that aside, with the discoverability and thinking about making these items discoverable, what do you think the benefits are for making these items discoverable generally? And I know you've touched on it, but I've heard you speak very articulately about this. So I'm hoping that you can um, you can talk about the benefits of making things discoverable and and why we want to do this work. Yeah, look, I think it's it's one of the things that people get consistently wrong 
um, when they think about this kind of work. There's this real assumption that um, Aboriginal people want to come in and lock everything down, that we want to make everything difficult to use, that you're going to need to ask 400 aunties you've never met before you even read a book. Um, that I think there is a real fear that that what we're trying to do, like, we don't have that kind of power and we would have done it already if we could. Just <laughs> the brutal honesty there. We're living in a world where these collections live in institutions we don't have power in, even when we have people that work in them. Um, and it's not something that we've we've wanted to do. It's the same as when um, non-Aboriginal people hear about land rights and they assume that if the power was reversed, Aboriginal people would turf everyone out and massacre them. I mean, it's it really shows the the your own biases and and the the culture you exist within when your assumption of of what people want to do is is the same as what maybe your ancestors did in the past this kind of work is going to open up so many more collections. It is going to give library staff who have no time, no Aboriginal friends, no ability to gain cultural knowledge, um, potentially no interest in it, the tools to know that what they're giving a client is safe to give them, that um, when they're working with non-Aboriginal researchers, they can say very clearly, this is fine. Community have looked at this and have allowed access. This is how they want that described. Um, or they're going to be able to say, yeah, that's actually locked down. This is the community you should contact. So let us know once you've got permission. It's actually going to make your jobs a lot easier. Um, and bringing some of that consistency that libraries are absolutely um, sometimes frustratingly famous for um, is, is what's needed. It's like, do we mention there's hundreds of language groups and within those, there's completely different views within families about how things should or shouldn't be managed. Um, the, the consistency we're talking about is this, this baseline of respectful descriptive work of anti-racism of, I don't think I've ever seen anything in a library catalog that is, is just noted that this is written by someone that, you know, is racist. We, we lump that in as a value term that we're not allowed to to use as, as neutral professionals, but the racism is a thing. It is a measurable thing that does exist. We are allowed to talk about it. We are allowed to put, you know, we put things like the past language warnings. We say, it, you know, this, this may have been considered offensive at the time. It definitely was considered offensive at the time, and it still is. Like, we we kind of equivocate around some of this stuff, and it gives this really soft, gentle racism that Australia has a hard racism and it allows us to be gaslit way too easily mm. um, when the evidence of this stuff is hidden away. It should be in the notes fields. It should be there. I shouldn't have to type buck to find a picture of my grandfather, but I should be able to look in there and, and see that they, the library that holds that image understands that this is how he was described, that this was the dynamic that that was created in. I mean, Aboriginal researchers have been working without this consistency, without quality metadata, have been able to be gaslit routinely, even when their research is impeccable. Um, we see what happens with things like dark emu. If, if you try to, to re-interrogate any of these collections from an Indigenous perspective, what this descriptive work does is give a baseline that this is honest, this is real, this is not tied to a left or right political agenda. This is what we should be doing. This has history did happen. And hot messes make hot messes. We can't be expecting good things to come out of our collections if we haven't done this work, if we haven't um, given these tools. So for me, the outcomes will be better scholarship, will be less of my First Nations colleagues and elders' time being eaten up explaining the same things over and over again because it will be standardised. It will be known that, um, that this is not something that we have to hide away. Um, and I think it will enable Aboriginal researchers who maybe are very time poor and don't have the capacity to be traveling into cities to access and find material that they had never seen. They had no idea was sitting in here and have absolutely nothing close to the time to come and spend a wonderful two weeks in Sydney on a research trip the way that some non-Aboriginal researchers might be able to. So it's going to have flow on effects that I think will reduce our ability to deny this history and will reduce our ability as a country to continually gaslight um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about our own cultures and our own sovereignty and history. Thank you so much, Damien. And that was so articulate and so amazing. So thank you for sharing. Tui, you've come off mute and I hope it's because you've got something to add. And also from your perspective, you are a researcher. So <laughs> what would you like to add to Damien's and anything from that researcher point of view? Yeah, I think um, I think a, a lot of people forget that Indigenous people are actually l using collections for cultural revitalization. Mm -hmm. 
a lot of our histories was recorded, taken, and we've got stolen generations, and this is our opportunity. And even for not the non-stolen generations members, it's an opportunity to reconnect with our objects. Our objects aren't dead things to us. They have an animacy to them. They are alive to us. They're our ancestors. They're embodied within those objects and materials. And for us to be able to reconnect with them is a, a continuation through deep time into our future. And so the description practices helps us reconnect with those things. I think that's what um, people don't understand about working with Indigenous collections. They're not dead. They're, they're alive to us. They're very much alive. Thank you, Tui. And um, thank you, Tui and Damien, for speaking so eloquently. And Michaela and Anthony, I'm also going to come to you because I think we've heard Damien and Tui talk about why it's so important to get this right and to, you know, to have this reparative and the proper descriptive practices. From the, the metadata expert point of view, I'd really like to hear what you both think and the, and the, the type of work that you think, the reason why you both feel this work so important to do. Oh no, I think we're having trouble with the mute button unless they really don't want to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Anthony wants to go first. Sorry. Um, I think I, I can't. I can't really answer it in 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 a specific sense. I can only give the general stuff that we mm. that we that we're touching on. I mean, we speaking with people from you know. We can only, I can only speak from from our experience of what yep. we do is that speaking with people. Um, who are looking at our materials? Who, who at times are the kind of uncles and aunties that never even look at catalogue records. Never, they don't know what we have. They don't know what's out there. They don't know where the belongings of their people are a lot of the time, and they don't even know where to look. And and um, and it's when they first touch base with you know, an IATSIS or a state library or a local library that these these things become um, apparent to people. And it's quite an astonishing moment to be there, quite a moving moment, and sometimes in a, tra a traumatic moment, um, and one not to be taken lightly when people touch touch um, even physically or, or virtually with things that are, are there um are, are their literal history um it's and, and so the, the that's that's putting on the same to you all that the work we do has such a profound impact um and and i say that from someone who's witnessed this kind of interaction firsthand it's extraordinary and um and it and you think you should take away the fact that what you do um um, does have that impact. It does. It, it is giving back. It, it, it really is, and um, yeah, that's that's probably the, the the best way I can describe it. In that sense, that we we provide that that interface. So what we what we do is incredibly important here. And from our perspective, we work closely with our Indigenous engagement um, section, who are led by Rebecca Bateman. And they hear from community. They hear the good, bad and the ugly of what we're doing. And they work together with community to, to work out a way forward for description. And then that just, those things are put down to us in our team and then we do that descriptive change. So it's either removing metadata, adding metadata, making something stronger, better. Um, and we don't like to burden um, the Indigenous engagement team, so they are empowering us to be able to have these solutions for ourselves and be able to think for ourselves and make these decisions. Um, sometimes scary, um, but we always give it a go and sometimes we get it wrong and people tell us and then we fix it. I think I'd probably add there too, it's... it's one of the things that we can't undo and and i've noticed a couple of things from some of our colleagues with some of the questions how do we go back and fix it all how do we go back through our catalog record and make it all better um and and i would say you're going to need an enormous amount of staff an enormous amount of time and our sector needs to be much better funded to be able to do that work damien hinted at that earlier too 
we can do global changes where we have the capacity to do that and work where we can pick up language and we can change bits and pieces here. But there is so much out there um, and, you know, you can think of things like even the even the objects which we've, the books that we've digitised are something there that contains information that, I say so that the um, Aranta people who've, who've said to me that if some of our um, elders could see this material, they'd be horrified because of the pictures that it contains. So what do we do? Do we write, do we immediately race out and 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 expunge all that material from the record? The question is, is that there's not something that we should do or can do it um, because we can't know everything. Um, so to some extent, we we need guidance um, about about questions like that. Um, Damien, I can see you've come off mute there. Did you have something uh, yeah. to add? I just wanted to do a shout out to the catalogists and description homies, um, the uncelebrated mole people of the profession, the people who do this amazing work, often so far away from communities or from people working walking into the building. Um, I've, I've worked with a lot of you all over the years and I guess this is some of the most meaningful work you will ever get to do as a cataloger. This is people will see your work, people will cherish the work that you do in this space and people will offer you feedback that is not something you can say about a lot of the descriptive and cataloging work that goes on it's it's unsung it's just getting it into the machine um this is an opportunity to to be seen and to feel like that work is making a difference because i assure you it does yes um tui you've come off mute as well Yep, I can give you a very real world example of where reparative description Fantastic. has made a huge impact. I it was my first day at the State Library and I uh, was met Damien and I'd wandered downstairs to do some work and I walked back upstairs and Damien goes, do you know Margaret Raven? I said, do you mean my twin sister or my mum? And he goes, oh, I assume your mum. Someone had come in and identified my mum as a baby in a photograph. And from that, it's the Mavis Wally collection. I reconnected with my whole family on that side. So it has very real world impacts for people. Um, and that was in relation to the, why you might have a separate collection with a photograph database so people can actually add stuff. It's not some far flung object that just sits somewhere. It actually affects us. So that's a very real, and like I said, first day on the job at the State Library, <laughs> I think I found my spot. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for sharing that Tui. And I guess, um, I guess the words that are echoing in my ears are from uh, Professor Bronwyn, Bronwyn Fredericks, who's the Pro, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor of Indigenous Engagement at UQ and was also one of the authors of the Uluru Statement of the Heart. And I remember when she came to UQ Library, where I used to work, she said, I don't want to see another piece of um, Aboriginal art hanging here and you telling me that you're doing something properly, like let's do some important work. Um, and I think Bronwyn Fredericks was spot on when she was thinking about this is the type of important work that you we need to be doing as libraries, not, um, I mean, hang, having welcoming spaces and, and flags is very important, but there's also other really critical work that we need to be focused on. So before we end, I'm going to ask each of you to answer, I don't know, one or two sentences. I won't, I won't give you an actual word count here. People are saying, oh, where do I start? What do I do? Where do I start? So if you could just say one thing to, um, to everyone, where, where do they start apart from we all know that the first place to start is reading the amazing guidelines that TUI has developed. So that cannot be your answer. But once they have done that, where should people start? Um, and I'm going to, TUI, you're going to be last here. We're going to go to you last. And Michaela and um, Anthony, I'm going to start with you. So where, where do I start? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take an easy one and say, um, who, who is your local community? And how and how best? What's the best way to engage them in talking about what you have and what your approach is going to be to bringing them into the discussions that's vital to describe your collection and make it discoverable? I'm going to say start that conversation. Talk to your colleagues. Talk if you're only if you're only in a you know I'm in a in a in a larger team, but if you're in a small team, is there a library nearby to you? Is there an archive nearby to you? Who can you join forces with to put that work that you need to put in collaboratively, collaboratively perhaps, and get that set of guidelines in? And look, reach out, you know, reach out to IAXIS um, and NLA. Um, and, you know, we're always happy for a chat. Thank you. 
Damien, where do I start? What do I do? Oh, God, how do you eat an elephant? Um, <laughs> I just became my nan saying that. God help us all. I mean, look, my experience is, is very much within state libraries and within institutions that have these massive problematic legacy collections. So I guess uh, my advice tends to come from, from people that have some of that legacy material because that's where I've spent most of my work. For people collecting new stuff, your job's easy. Unless people are all still alive, you can ask them how they want to be described. Um, I mean... As Tui mentioned, working with photos is a really good one. If you don't have relationships, it's the kind of thing people want to come and sit at a barbecue with some iPads and have a look with some of your outreach stuff. Um, but pick a part of your collection or a collection within your collection that is geographically and temporally bound. That is from one decade, from one town, one place. Um, do not start with something sprawling that is going to immediately put you at loggerheads with three different um, traditional owner groups that have different ideas and, and no idea where boundaries exist. Pick something that is bound to a specific moment in time and to a specific piece of geography um, and start working from there outwards. Thanks, Damien. And finally, Tui, where am I starting? Um, I echo what everyone says about um, choosing part of your collection to work with with that community. Um, but if you don't know where to start at all, that can also be really problematic. You don't know who your communities are. You need a bit of a learning opportunity. The best thing to do is do a keyword search of your collection, of your catalogue. Start off with Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, any of those keyword phrases that you have that may be considered racist go through them and start adding where you know what they are where they're from potentially adding the codes into them yoslane codes what that'll do is start it will help you identify then what your collection holds so if you have no connections to your community and you know where to start do a keyword search start working on that in the back end even if you've got no input from your community that will help you learn about your community your collection and then you will go oh we've got a huge collection from this because they were just previously catalogued, catalogued under Aboriginal. Whereas now we actually know that they're from, I don't know, a small community in Western Victoria. So that's for people who might be a cataloger whose head is just down in the catalogue or anyone in a metadata specialist role who won't even talk to an Indigenous person probably, but needs somewhere to start. That's probably a really good start. And that's how I look at collections. When I go into a collection and I know nothing about it, I ask for a keyword search for a quick audit, and then I have it go do some, um, pull out a few records, and then I start to get a sense of what's in the collection. Thank you. And thank you to all of the panellists. And I can see so many people um, adding their thanks. So I just know how appreciated this has been. And I, again, I would like to thank all of you um, to, um, I think you're all laughing at the mole people hashtag. I love it, Damien. I'd like, to, that's going to be trending. Um, but I would like to thank all of the panellists who are all really busy for putting their time in to, to come and, and share all of your insights today. It's been amazing. And again, thank you so much to Tui who has just been done and I, I can't even think of the words to describe it. I am literally lost for words um, when I think about the amount of work you've done. So thank you to all the panelists. And just before we close, uh, we might just throw up this slide as everybody's leaving to thank the other people that have been involved in this project and who alongside me have had the immense privilege of watching um, watching from a very close sidelines, do I say courtside, um, as we watch uh, Tui, Tui do this work. So thank you. And I think uh, Abby's got that uh, final slide to, to share just to thank the advisory groups. So thank you everybody for um, for this and thank you the panelists. And I'll, I can see everyone's leaving. So have a lovely afternoon and enjoy the rest of your day. And um, yeah, I'm sure you'll all uh, learn a lot from these guidelines. Thank you. <laughs>